I'm trying to see if y'all all found places. Yes, you did. The sociology department at Tech wants a report. Okay. We're going to do this until at least confirmation. Because I want you up close when we confirm the kids this year. I want you to be able to see the smile on their faces when they become members of the church. So it's okay. And those really are Lenten chairs, meant, meant, to, meant to make you uncomfortable. Are you uncomfortable yet? You're uncomfortable? Really, they're, un they're uncomfortable? Yeah, I got one more thing. They'll make you more uncomfortable than the chairs. I could have you stand up and pass the peace, couldn't I? No, 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 no. Okay, I'll, I'll get back on script now. Oh, good, I found the clock. That was the one thing I was worried about. Where's my clock? It's back there. The booth people are also afraid because they've heard, because I told them so, that if you set me up in a configuration like this, I'm liable to do things like this. So everybody be nervous. Be very nervous. From the 18th chapter of Luke's gospel, we hear these words. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this week in your Essential Jesus readings, you will be reading the parables of Jesus or some of them. And we love the parables of Jesus because they're stories we remember from Growing up in Sunday school, there are stories that, you know, a preacher expounded in such a way that it resonated with us. They're, they're simple stories that we can find the Jesus character and the God character. And the truth be told, we always try to plug ourselves in a parable to figure out who we are and where we fit. And that's the point of a parable. I really want to hope you get. They are not great moral statements. They are stories about identity. They are stories about you belonging to God's kingdom or you belonging to God or you fitting in. Almost every one of the stories can be read with that notion of inclusion, with that notion of lifting out, lifting up the outcast and the down and out. So, Parables are simple if you keep in mind what they're about. They're about identity. To interpret a parable, you got to figure out who Jesus is talking to. That's very important as you lay an interpretation on the parable. In the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus tells three stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, and his brother. And he tells the stories related back to the, the Pharisees and the scribes who were grumbling. So as you're reading the scripture and Jesus is telling a story, first question to look for is who's he telling the story to? Is he telling it to just folks sitting around or is he telling it to disciples or is he aiming them at um, the scribes and the Pharisees? He also told parables, and this might make you a little uncomfortable. He says 
to people who ask him in Matthew, the reason I speak in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. He, in a certain way, is attempting to be veiled. He wants you to go home and figure out what it means for yourself. And that very often is what happens with a parable. About 2.30 this afternoon, this sermon will finally land and you go, oh, I get it. You hear them differently in worship. You hear them differently when you're, you're reading them by yourself or when you're studying them alone. So pay attention to who Jesus is talking to. Don't push the details. We've got one of those today. Do not push the details of a parable. And there's always a twist at the end. So that being said, what Jesus is saying is, first of all, prayer conquers fear. Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. Pressure is starting to come to bear against Jesus. The scribes, Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees have all kind of ganged up on Jesus. They've decided, we've got to get rid of this guy. He is a danger to Judaism. He's a danger to our nation, Israel. He is going to just cheese the Romans off, and they're going to come in here. They're going to fight a war. They're going to tear our temple down. They're going to disperse us again, and our nation won't exist. We've got to shut this man up. And so around the ministry of Jesus, this yipping is starting to go on with the scribes and the Pharisees. They're trying to trap him. They want to kill him. Anything to shut him up. And the disciples who've left everything to follow him are going, huh? What's going on? What's happening? We're afraid. We don't like this. And so Jesus is telling his disciples and those listening, pray. When you're afraid, pray. Don't lose heart. Get on your knees and ask God to do something. And then he says persistence in prayer is appropriate. It's an appropriate response to piety. So remember that as we dive right on on into this parable. Judges in that time are not like judges today. We elect our judges in Louisiana. Some judges are appointed. And when you go into a courtroom, you have to be on the docket. That's the official sheet of paper that says, whatever happens today, here's your case. And they call cases based on the docket and based on some other things. In that court system, what happened was the judge was an elder in the town or connected or related, sat in the grand high pooh bear seat. These weren't seats. They just, you've seen them. They're reclining on big pillows. There the judge was on the biggest pillows and surrounding the judge again on pillows. Don't you wish we had Lenten pillows in here today? We could all be on the floor like they are in the ancient Near East. And, I, and that's fine until it, you have to stand up to worship God and there's a lot of moaning. Anyway, around the judge are a bunch of secretaries and court officials, and so you've got the judge in the middle, and surrounding the judge are all these folks in a courtroom, and still today there are people in a courtroom that have specific functions. Well, these court people, their official function was to collect money because there was no docket. You just showed up on the day the judge was going to be there, and you would tell like the further secretary, further secretary, I've got a case I need to bring before the judge. Here's my money. The amount of money you gave the court officials was where you fell on the docket. The more money, the higher up on the docket. The more money, the more likely your case was to be decided the way you wanted it decided. Anything you got, got a property dispute, you start laying the money on this one over here. Now, if you see your opponent laying the money on that one over there, a little bidding war starts, and you don't know who's paying the most money out until the judge renders decision. That is the court process behind this scripture. So, the judge, we're told, neither fears God nor respects any human being. Atheism gone wild. 
has no regard for God, doesn't care what people think about him. That's what it means in Greek. He feels no shame. It doesn't matter if he rules judiciously or if he rules corruptly. It doesn't bother him. He's collecting his fees. A woman comes to plead her case to seek justice against her opponent. In that culture, men were the ones who came to court. Women had no standing in that culture unless there was a son or unless there was a goel, which uh, that's in the book of Ruth if you want to look that one up. Unless you had a male advocate, you could not get on the docket. Don't know what her case was. It probably was a dispute with a relative who would not uh, give her her part of the inheritance or her husband's part of the inheritance. That's likely it. She has no money for bribe. She has no mail. What's she to do? She keeps interrupting court. Judge, I'm still out here. I was out here last week. You ignored me, but judge, I'm back. And my opponent is treating me unjust, unjustly. Judge, I want justice. And if you don't give me justice, I'm going on Judge Wapner. I'm going to get justice, judge. She won't shut up. She just will not. Sh and the judge... He doesn't have a gavel, and even if he had a gavel, all he's got around him are pillows. It's not going to make any noise. He can't get the court quiet because this woman keeps nagging him. I don't know, men, if you've ever been in that situation where she just won't let go of it. None of you are like that. None of you guys are like that either. Just won't let it go. Just well, I can't believe they rearranged those chairs on Sunday morning and for all afternoon and all week. We've got them over and under about how many phone calls we'll get this week. I oh, just can't believe it. They got to put my seat back up. Well, when we figure out how to keep children from falling through up there, we will. Hmm. Okay. You know what it's like to be nagged, don't you? You know what it's like to nag people, don't you? She's nagging him. As a matter of fact, in verse 5, it says, the, the judge says, I don't fear God, I don't respect any, anybody, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. May not wear me out is a Greek verb that is translated, keeps punching me in the face. Right here, this is what she's doing. That's the image of what Jesus is talking about. The judge is tired of this lady giving him a black eye. He doesn't care what she thinks. He doesn't care what the country thinks about him ruling against her. She's just beating him up. You ever prayed that way? No, not us. We pray thy will be done in Jesus' name. We never dare stand before the Lord God Almighty and go, God, I'm here, and I want what I want. I've been praying about this for years, God. Give it to me. Do you nag God in prayer? Is there anything in your life that's worth that to you? I got a whole list of people that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I've been praying for some of those people for years. I got calluses that have their names on them. And I just keep going to God and I say, God, I want this. You want this. Get busy. No, we don't pray like that. We enter a whole different mindset as though we come up with enough church words, throw in, that will be done, in Jesus' name. And that's what we call fervent prayer. Jesus just depicted it as a battle. Not with you and the devil. 
but with you and God. So you don't push the details here because you don't want God to be this dishonorable judge, and that's what happens if you push the details. But there's a twist at the end of this parable. And the twist is what Jesus says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. God, well, let's listen to what Jesus said about it. Here comes the twist from the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and it will be given you. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there any among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone, or if a child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then who are evil, the judge in Luke, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? If a corrupt judge who cares neither for God nor for human beings eventually gives in to this woman, how much more quickly will a God who loves you answer your prayers and give you the desires of your heart? And then Jesus puts a zinger on the end. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people who are praying with determination? Will he find people who are serving with determination? Will he find people who are using a period of Lent to, in a determined way, deepen their relationship with God? So what's next for you? Prayer. What's eating at your heart? What do you want in here more than anything else you can think of? What do you want? Have you placed that before God? Have you gone to God and said, I'm staying here until either you change my mind and heart or I get what I'm seeking. How determined are you when you pray? How determined are you when you serve in the church? Ah, here's the, here's the QR code in the book. It's the book. The QR code and in the book, no, we don't do it in the book, do we? The QR code will take you to a spiritual gift survey or an inventory. You can learn about what your spiritual gifts are. It's a pretty neat inventory. And then the books put ways of serving Trinity together with your spiritual gift. Kind of neat, isn't it? Let you serve out of your strength. Some of you don't, some of you may not know you have the gift of apostleship or the gift of leadership or the gift of, some of you may not know you have the gift of prophecy of miracles. So we're asking you to do that during Lent. And we're also asking you to open your heart and your life to the power of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If your God who loves you hears you pray, how quickly will he answer those prayers? I hope you find out. I hope you get the desire of your heart. Scripture promised God's able to do far more abundantly than we can either ask or think. I want to see those prayers answered in your life. We come to this table acknowledging another twist that's found in this parable, that God vindicates and God brings justice. God vindicated the widow, and God in the resurrection will vindicate his son Jesus. 
we come reminded that God does bring justice and God does make things right. 